This is Crystal Stanage, and thank you so much for joining me for this week's First Chapter Friday. Today, I will be reading from the beginning of Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park. I have grown up with the movies, but never ever read the book, so it was very exciting to pick this book as our uh, book club selection this month, and it ties perfectly into the winter reading program of Dinosaurs. So, uh, hope you enjoy. Introduction. The Engine Incident. The late 20th century has witnessed a scientific gold rush of astonishing proportions, the headlong and furious haste to commercialize genetic engineering. This enterprise has proceeded so rapidly with so little outside commentary that its dimensions and implications are hardly understood at all. Biotechnology promises the greatest revolution in human history. By the end of this decade, it will have outdistanced atomic power and computers in its effect on our everyday lives. In the words of one observer, biotechnology is going to transform every aspect of human life, our medical care, our food, our health, our entertainment, our very bodies. Nothing will ever be the same again. It's literally going to change the face of the planet. But the biotechnology revolution differs in three important respects from past scientific transformations. First, it is broad-based. America entered the atomic age through the work of a single research institution at Los Alamos. It entered the computer age through the efforts of about a dozen companies. But biotechnology research is now carried out in more than 2,000 laboratories in America alone. 500 corporations spend $5 billion a year on this technology. Second, much of the research is thoughtless or frivolous. Efforts to engineer paler trout for better visibility in the stream, square trees for easier lumbering, and injectable scent cells so you'll always smell of your favorite perfume may seem like a joke, but they are not. Indeed, the fact that biotechnology can be applied to the industries traditionally subject to the vagaries of fashion, such as cosmetics and leisure activities, heightens concern about the whimsical use of this powerful new technology. Third, the work is uncontrolled. No one supervises it. No federal law regulates it. There's no coherent government policy in America or anywhere else in the world. And because the products of biotechnology range from drugs to farm crops to artificial snow, an intelligent policy is difficult. But most disturbing is the fact that no watchdogs are found among scientists themselves. It is remarkable that nearly every scientist in genetics research is also engaged in the commerce of biotechnology. There are no detached observers. Everybody has a stake. The commercialization of molecular biology is the most stunning ethical event in the history of science, and it has happened with astonishing speed. For 400 years since Galileo, science has always proceeded as a free and open inquiry into the workings of nature. Scientists have always ignored national boundaries, holding themselves above the transitory concerns of politics and even wars. Scientists have always rebelled against secrecy in research and have even frowned on the idea of patenting their discoveries, seeing themselves as working to the benefit of all mankind. And for many generations, the discoveries of scientists did indeed have a peculiarly selfless quality. When, in 1953, two young researchers in England, James Watson and Francis Crick, deciphered the structure of DNA, their work was hailed as a triumph of the human spirit, of the centuries-old quest to understand the universe in a scientific way. It was confidently expected that their discovery would be selflessly extended, extended to the greater benefit of mankind. Yet, that did not happen. 
30 years later, nearly all of Watson and Crick's scientific colleagues were engaged in another sort of enterprise entirely. Research in molecular genetics had become a vast, multi-billion dollar commercial undertaking, and its origins can be traced not to 1953, but to April 1976. That was the date of a now famous meeting in which Robert Swanson, a venture capitalist, approached Herbert Boyer, a biochemist at the University of California. The two men agreed to found a commercial company to exploit Boyer's gene splicing techniques. Their new company, Genentech, quickly became the largest and most successful of the genetic engineering startups. Suddenly, it seemed as if everyone wanted to become rich. New companies were announced almost weekly, and scientists flocked to exploit genetic research. By 1986, at least 362 scientists, including 64 in the National Academy, sat on the advisory boards of biotech firms. The number of those who held equity positions or consultancies was several times greater. It is necessary to emphasize how significant this shift in attitude actually was. In the past, pure scientists took a snobbish view of business. They saw the pursuit of money as intellectually uninteresting, suited only to shopkeepers. And to do research for industry, even at the prestigious Bell or IBM labs, was only for those who couldn't get a university appointment. Thus, the attitude of pure scientists was fundamentally critical to the work of applied scientists and to industry in general. Their long-standing antagonism kept university scientists free of contaminating industry ties. And whenever debate arose about technological matters, disinterested scientists were available to discuss the issues at the highest levels. But that is no longer true. There are very few molecular biologists and very few research institutions without commercial affiliations. The old days are gone. Genetic research continues at a more furious pace than ever, but it is done in secret and in haste and for profit. And if you would like to know how the book differs from the movie, because there are quite a few differences, please check out this book. Uh, this copy is available on Libby. We do have some physical copies available through the library. Uh, join me here next week as I read from the beginning of The Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs, A New History of a Lost World by Steve Brusati. Thanks and have a great week.